Hey there. Welcome to this episode of Chip Chats, Chip Coffee Co. Coffee Podcast, if you're listening to this on the podcast, and welcome to everybody watching on YouTube. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit more in depth about Q-Grade. To start us off, I need to do a shout out for Michael Riley. Um, Riley is running another Q course um, next year, February 2020, from the 10th to the 15th. If you're interested in doing the full um, Q Grader combo course, which is training and calibration plus the exams, get in touch with Riley. Um, Riley at coffeeandq.co.uk. I'll also drop the email below on the YouTube and the podcast link. I did a shout out about this on my Facebook and Instagram yesterday. Um, and a friend of mine, Chris Campbell, left a question about it and it was a really interesting question. Hey Chris. Um, his question was, roughly how long does it take the average person to achieve Q grader status and about how expensive does the necessary training tend to be? Which is a really hard question to answer because it's all dependent on that person's ability and experience. You could have a person who's like quite well experienced in cupping for like a couple of years. And I'll say well experienced, you've got a whole range of specialty coffee from 80 to 89, a little bit plus as well. Um, but I've also seen really well experienced cuppers who have only really been tasting and scoring high quality Arabicas who then fail because they're not able to accurately score and taste the low end of specialty, even to the, like, the commodity stuff, because there is commodity things in CQI. You need to be able to tell what is specialty and what isn't. So they do test you on commodity grade stuff as well. Um, so I want to see it's opportunity to sort of talk more about what people would experience in Q grade and help you if you are thinking about doing the Q grader course, help you prepare yourself for taking the Q. So I'm going to sort of run through the exams that will happen, how you can prepare yourself a little bit better for them if you wanted to do that. And you don't have to be like really, really well experienced. You don't have to have years and years and years of coffee experience and cupping experience behind you. I've seen people who have only just started in the coffee industry take the Q and pass. Like, it's not unheard of. If your ability to taste is really good, you can do it. But it does help to have coffee experience behind you. Um, I would say a couple of years cupping minimum of like consistent cupping as well, because you can you can tell who the experienced ones are and aren't. Um, but yeah, we're going to run through sort of the exams that you'll come up against during Q. So the first one, um, this isn't in any particular order, the order that you'll do them in, it changes or it could be completely wrong, I'm just going through it as I remember them. Um, so like I was saying actually with Riley's Q course, the full Q course you get two days of training and calibration and this is when you'll go through um, all the exams in a training situation. So you'll go through the olfactory, the sensory, the green grading, Absolutely everything that we get tested on will happen in your calibration and training days. So it's really worthwhile doing the full course just for the training and calibration side of it as well. Um, and then when you go into the exams, you're a lot better prepared. So the first one we'll, we'll talking that we will be talking about is olfactory. So the olfactory exams is when you're smelling and sniffing the Lunated Cafe box, which if you've not seen, everybody on YouTube, looks like this. It is a box of about 33, I think, I think it's 33 little vials of aromas going through enzymatic, dry distillation, sugar browning and aromatic taints. And they come in little bottles like this, which are all numbered from 1 to 28, uh, yeah, 36, 36. So you don't have to memorize all these. I would really recommend getting one of these. If you know somebody who's got one, try and borrow one for a little while. If your roastery has one, spend some time learning these. Don't bother learning the numbers on the bottles though, because CQI have obviously caught you out on this. 
they'll tape up the bottles and put their own codes on the masking tape or on the bottles so you can't just look at the number and memorise that because that's what they used to do when they first started Q and um, a lot of people cheated just by doing that. So if you can get yourself a Lineage Cafe, I mean I'd recommend buying one for yourself. They are 250 quid, usually I think you can buy them off the SEA website so they're pretty expensive but they're really worthwhile. Um, the last, probably at best for a couple of years because it is liquid in there and stuff, it does start to go a little bit stale and the aromas start to fade a little bit. But I mean, I've had mine for three years now and I still use it. It's definitely degraded a little bit, but it still does the job. Um, so yeah, the Lineda Cafe is great. Learning the smells in that will really help you for your factory exams. There's four exams in your factory. Like I was saying, the enzymatic dry distillation, sugar burning, aromatic taints. You've essentially got to match up what the coded bottle is to a certain aromatic and just being able to recognise it and accurately describe what it is. So it's not the hardest exam in the world, but we've had a fair few people having to do resits of them and such. Um, so it's quite worthwhile getting your hand on one of these kits and just spending some time learning it, practicing, and you know, don't cheat yourself. Properly try it and practice it because it's really good fun as well. Um, after that, you've got sensory solutions. Now, personally, I find this the hardest one. I hate solutions. Um, if you're wanting to try and practice sensory solutions at home, I'd recommend finding Ted Lingle's Coffee Covers Handbook. That will essentially go through and tell you how to prepare a sensory solutions kit to test yourself. So this is when you've got a set of cups in front of you. There's, on the first one there's nine, and you've got sugar, or you've got sweet, sour, and salt in three sets of intensities. And you've got to be able to assess and accurately find out which one is salt, sweet, sour, and then put the intensities of them in the right order. So it's a fairly simple test, but um, some people will struggle, especially on the salt and the sours. I mean, the sweet's fairly easy, like the sweet is really, really sweet. The medium intensity is like, it's a bit sweeter than the weak and the weak's really weak. So once you can sort of get that, again, if you can do some training for that, I would definitely recommend doing solutions training because the second part of the um, sensory exam is the hardest part when you've got mixed solutions. So you could have like a high intensity sweet mixed with a low intensity salt and a weak intensity sour. And you've got to be able to assess what's in that cup and write it down, it's really hard. That's, that's the one I really, really struggle with myself, is the sensory solutions mixed. So you could have like a sweet three with a um, sour two, and it's just hard to get that and accurately describe, right, this is a sour three or a sour sweet three or whatever I said. Um, but yes, if you can do that, get Ted Lingle's Coffee Cup's Handbook um, and test yourself on that because Personally, I find that the hardest one. Um, next, you'll have green grading. If you've not gone, done green grading before, find some samples of green coffee. Um, in the exams, you'll be using 350 gram samples. You don't have to use 350 gram samples. It'd be great if you can, um, but get some different qualities of coffee. So get some really high-end stuff where you won't have many defects, if any, in there. Um, get some lower grade stuff, maybe some like 80 to 81, there might be a few defects in there and try and find some commodity grade coffees as well also to go through your green grading because you'll find defects in there and it'll be really good useful practice for you. Also if you can, if your roastery has one, if you're doing this independently, find the SGA Green Defect Handbook that essentially tells you what defects to look for, how to assess the defects properly, how to score it as well, because you need to be able to assess whether that coffee sample would be considered specialty or out of specialty on the defects. Um, 
And you'll have things like your full blacks, your brokens, part sours, floaters, fungus damage, insect damage, severe and um, minimal. What's the term for that? I've forgotten. It's been a long, long day already. Um, so yeah, green grading is a really important one. You will get a couple of green grading um, training sessions through the full course. So like, if you're not too confident with it, especially if you're practicing it on your own, just find some coffee, get a handbook and try go through it and then you'll do a couple of like proper training sessions with Riley and myself and another assistant, it might be Andy Prosser, who is a great guy. Um, he's really, really experienced and well knowledgeable in all areas coffee. Um, so it's really useful to go through it with somebody else as well. Um, the next one, organic acids. So this is a really interesting one. I quite enjoy organic acids and this is where you have to be able to tell what acids are in a weak solution of coffee. So you'll have malic, phosphoric, um, acetic and citric acid, which are all placed in cups and you'll have like a standard coffee. Essentially in the test you've got four cups in front of you on eight samples. So you'll have eight sets of four cups Two of the cups will be spiked with an acid, whether it's citric, malic, one of the others, and you'll have two standard cups. So you've got to be able to tell which cups are spiked with the acid and then what that acid is. Some people find this really, really hard. I think with a little bit of practice and training, you can do this quite easily. Um, it is possible to find, I mean, citric acid is fairly easy to find. You can find food grade citric acid powder and then just make a solution to the correct sort of molar density. Um, acetic acid, uh, that's essentially vinegar you can practice with. Um, it's the malic and phosphoric, which is a little bit harder to practice with, but I think you can find food grade acid solutions of these. Um, and I think one molar is the correct density for them and do about nine drops per 150 mil off the top of my head. I think that's what we use. I can't 100% remember, but I think that's it. Um, so yeah, training yourself on organic acids. And these are the acids that you'll typically find within green coffee, um, not green coffee, roasted coffee. There are obviously other acids that you'll find like quinic, lactic and several others, but these are sort of the four main ones that CQI want you to be able to assess and assess it accurately. So organic acids is quite a tough one, but it's a really useful one for you to practice if you are thinking about trying to practice this. Um, next one, roast ID. Roast ID is a fairly simple one if you're used to cupping um, like quality control roasts and like doing production QC. So in roast ID you'll have, they do it in triangulation sets now, so you'll have a protocol roast, a dark roast, a light roast, and a baked roast. Um, now, through when you get into cupping roasted coffees, CQI, their protocol is maybe a little bit darker to the general UK standard of a protocol roast, but it's still, it's within SCI protocol, obviously, but it's a little bit on the further developed side than maybe we're used to in the UK. Um, so you have to get yourself dialed into that a little bit first um, and then be able to assess baked light. The light is just like quite nice, acidic. I think it's the easiest one to tell. People usually mess up on the protocol, which is the standard and the baked profile. Um, if you've not tasted baked coffee before or been able to recognize it, I'm sure you've all probably tasted baked coffee before, but just not recognized it. Um, baked is a really interesting one because it sort of tastes really grainy, cereally, a bit like Weetabix. Um, I sometimes think of it as like bread that's starting to prove, like proving bread. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ways and means you can test yourself on that. If you've got an Akawa or you've got access to an Akawa, you can roast some coffee to all these different profiles. If you want, I've got profiles to roast because that's how I did my training. I sometimes do workshops on this sort of thing. Um, get in touch, I can send you my Akawa profiles on the SCA protocol, bait, light and dark, and just train yourself with that because that's 
really useful to do. Um, and then the other ones you'll have like general knowledge, um, which I can't really help you prepare for, just read some books, learn about coffee. A lot of it is just logic, to be fair. Um, there's 100 questions and I think the pass rate is 75%, I think, I could be wrong, I can't remember. Um, and then roast defects, which is the easiest of exams to pass, like you've got to find Quakers in roasted coffee. And if you can't find Quakers in roasted coffee, you shouldn't be doing Q. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's an easy one to do. Um, and then the big ones, the hardest ones where most people will fail and fall down is cuppings and triangulations. So you'll have four cuppings and four triangulation exams. During this, you'll have, um, what is it, milds, which you're talking, usually all, it will be washed coffees, usually from Central and South America, so you'll have like Colombia, Honduras, Nicaragua, Brazil, all those sort of areas. What would be considered milds, I know it's quite an old school term, um, but it's generally Central and South American coffees, all washed. Um, and you'll have to do that in a cupping scenario. So for all the cupping exams, and this is where the training calibration side really comes in useful, you've got to be able to accurately score and assess the coffees. Um, so this could be a non-specialty coffee. So they do have coffees that are there on purpose that are non-specialty. And you've got to be able to assess and accurately score that as non-specialty. Um, you'll have some really high-end coffees, you'll have some in the middle. And it's all about, it's not necessarily your skill to be right on the score, it's about being able to calibrate correctly and accurately with the group. Because there will be a mean score for the group and your ability to score within that mean of the group. Um, which is hard, you know, if you're not used to cupping with other people and scoring with other people, it can be quite difficult to get into that. So the calibration days are really, really important and really useful for that. Um, during all these cuppings, there'll also sometimes be planned defects where we will spike coffees on certain cups, on certain samples with a defect. It could be fermented, um, mould or phenolic usually. Um, and you've got to be able to pick up these defects, score it accurately as well. You've got to be able to pick it up if it's just ununiformity, if it's taint, if it's a full fault. Um, you've got to be able to score that correctly as well. Um, but some people sometimes like miss defects, they'll sometimes make up defects that aren't there. Um, and then nature those defects in the coffees as well, which happens a lot on um, naturals it happens where you just get natural coffee defects popping up and we're like, well, we've not planned any of that, but it's been scored. The instructors and assistants will all cup every sample of coffee on all the tables, so we'll be able to assess what's there and what isn't there, if there is any natural defects that's popped up as well. Um, so defects, get some low-grade coffee to test yourself on. It's, it will be useful for you. Um, so the other cuppings and triangulations, you've got Miles, Naturals, Africans and Asians. I would recommend if you're thinking about doing Q, going to find some coffees from all of these places and get loads of different grades of coffee. Get some high-end stuff, get some really low-end stuff, find yourself a little bit of commodity stuff as well because it will really help you like tasting defects, tasting lower grade coffees, get some 80 point coffees, get some mid-range coffees. And you could do this just through samples, or you can buy coffees from other roasters. It would be really useful. Um, but there's a lot, there is a lot there, like when you're doing QA, it's a really, really intense week. I think sometimes a lot of people who are really good cuppers sometimes find the pressure and sort of the nerves of doing Q can put them off a little bit. So a little bit of training yourself with your roastery, with your colleagues, can really put you in a good place for doing Q. Um, but training and classes and courses and stuff isn't absolutely necessary to do Q. If you want to go and do it, I'm sure it will help you. But it's not absolutely essential to pass Q. And 
To be fair, having Q, it depends what you're wanting to do and what you're wanting to do with the Q. I think I've said this before a while back, Q's not absolutely essential to go into a QCing job in a roast meat or going into a green coffee job. It will certainly help you, but it's not essential. If you're a really ex well experienced and a good cupper and your ability sort of stands out as itself, you don't need Q, but it will help. And doing the Q course with a great instructor like Mike will put you in a great place. Um, Mike runs pretty much all the UK Q courses now. I think there's a few others popping in. I know Rookie's coming in from the US. Um, Paulina dots about sometimes. And Alan over in Ireland is a good instructor. He's just been signed off for his full Q instructor. So well done, Alan. Um, and he's a good instructor as well. Really nice chap. Um, so yeah, if you have any more questions about Q, drop some comments um, or drop some questions in the comments or send me an email. Make sure to hit like on this video and this podcast because it really helps out the channel, both the podcast and the YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and following. Get in touch if you've got any more questions. I shall see you for the next one. Let's get booming. Peace.